off the rails. But finally, last night, Canada, the U.S. and Mexico reached a tentative trade deal, an agreement in principle. The Prime Minister has long said no deal is better than a bad deal. So is this better than no deal? That's a tongue twister. Joining me now is Laura Dawson, director of the Canada Institute at the Wilson Centre, and Mary Scott Greenwood, a former U.S. diplomat to Canada, now a principal at Dentons. We, what questions do you have for everyone watching? We want to hear from you. You can send us your questions on Facebook, on Twitter, or on YouTube, and I will take them as they come in. I'll start off with a couple selfishly of my own. Laura, I'll start with you. Nice to see you here in uh, in Ottawa. Tariffs. We just spoke with Jim Wilson, uh, Minister, Minister Jim Wilson from the Ontario government, and his takeaway was they should not have left those 232 steel and aluminum tariffs floating up in the air, uh, hanging in the balance and, and sign this deal, or at least they should have held out for more. What do you think? I can see that point. I was really divided on, on it as well, but it's the difference between the deal you could get and an optimum deal. Um, it, they had a really narrow window to finish this deal off. The president, you know, was ready to pull the plug. Uh, there was a very narrow window of opportunity. And so what, what they did was they left the 232 possibility on the table, certainly the steel, steel and aluminum, but Canada just decided it wasn't the hill it was going to die on. There's all sorts of other allies in the world, uh, European Union, Congress, business community, who also um, are opposed to these tariffs. So I think Canada's just took the deal they could get, and they're going to wait till they get more bench strength to push against the 232s. Scotty, I found the president's comments on these tariffs so interesting today. I think he called people who were complaining about them babies, and he included members of Congress in that. But essentially, he made the point that, yes, I did use these as leverage, and it worked was what he said. Does he have a point? Well, the weird thing about it, uh, Vashi, is that he said, I use them as leverage, um, and it worked, and, and we're getting deals, and yet then you would think that if you got a deal with Canada, then therefore you should take them down. You should take down these 232 steel and aluminum tariffs. They're doing real damage already to the U.S. economy, not to mention Canada and Mexico. Um, and so he's kind of all over the place on this. Uh, what, what the White House, I talked to the White House about it after the press conference, and what the White House and PMO are saying is it's on a separate track. All I can hope is that that's a fast track, that, that we get to some sort of a resolution of these tariffs because they also come with retaliation. Uh, so we really need to get that part done um, as soon as possible. It is a good day, and I'm glad that the perfect wasn't the enemy of the good. I agree with Laura on that. But I do think it's enormously important that we, that we get these tariffs um, dealt with. Because remember, the premise, the president says he's using them for leverage, but then what the rest of his government says is, oh, no, it's, it's a national security complaint that we have with Canada, which is even more insulting and um, on its face not, not even sustainable as an argument. Of course, Canada and the United States are connected security partners. So anyway, the U.S. is all over the place on this, and we really need to fix it. Yeah, the, the 232s are actually written into the auto deal. In order to enforce that auto deal, mm -hmm. they need to continue to use that national security tariff. So I don't buy the argument that they're transient and fleeting. I think it's they've got to be rooted out of there. Can I ask yeah. you both really quickly about next steps? And I, I found it interesting that the Prime Minister today said, you know, the, I mean, yes, we're sort of reveling in the fact that there's an agreement in principle, but we haven't totally crossed the finish line next. Are there substantive hurdles to this agreement actually coming into effect? Laura, sure. I'll start with you. Sure. I mean, uh, finishing off these negotiations, they first of all had to make sure that anything that Mexico had left undone was done. Not that Mexico didn't do a really good job, but they did it very quickly. So they had to make sure that they had a deal that was satisfactory to the trilateral arrangement. Then the Canadians had to make sure it was satisfactory to enough of their stakeholders, keeping in mind that there were going to be some provinces and some sectors that were kind of ticked off. And then they had to figure out a deal that was appropriate, that would be acceptable by both uh, Republicans in Congress and and Democrats in Congress. So I'll let Scotty talk more about the political dynamics there in the U.S. Okay, quickly, I'll get you to weigh in. Scotty, and a reminder to everyone on Facebook and Twitter, send in your questions. We're about to start uh, using them. So <laughs> I'll just f finish up with uh, Scotty on, on that point. Sure. Well, the major undone uh, piece in the United States, of course, is ratification by Congress. All three countries have their own process to go through. And by the time this gets to the U.S. Congress, uh, there's likely to be a different Congress and potentially a different uh, party in control. So the a question is whether a Democratic House uh, would be willing to ratify a Trump trade deal uh, that he's claiming so much credit for. Uh, so it, it was difficult. Laura remembers, as I do, and, and you may too, Vashi, back in the day when we 
uh, had the first ratification of NAFTA with President Clinton and Speaker Newt Gingrich, two opposite parties, uh, getting it across the goal line. And it was a fight. It was a close vote. Uh, people lost their seats over it. My friend Buddy Darden, congressman of Georgia, voted the right way, the free trade way, uh, for NAFTA originally. And then he was defeated in the subsequent election. So uh, it's really high stakes politics, and it's certainly not over yet. Okay, let me take a question from Evan on Twitter. Laura, how does the USMCA rank for Canada in between the best and worst possible agreements? How would you rate it? Uh, on a defensive level, it ranks as one of the st strong guest agreements because, look, 75% of Canadian exports go to the United States. You can't do without the NAFTA. And so they got a, a great uh, balance between uh, holding the line on defensive interests and getting some, some new elements. Now, frankly, the Canada-EU agreement and the Trans-Pacific Partnership both have lots of um, bells and whistles, very progressive, very uh, digging down deeper into, into trade and, and and, uh, economic objectives but our trade Canada's trade with those two regions is so relatively minimal that they had to get something they had to get the usmica usmaca uh, <laughs> right uh, with uh, with North America so that is really the top priority in terms of importance even though it's not the most forward-leaning deal that could have been done okay and uh, Scotty Jason Das on Facebook asked does this new deal address anything in terms of working workers looking to apply for visas or TN visas and create more jobs for US MCA exemptions I totally wish it did and uh, my reading is that it, it didn't although I haven't finished uh combing through it, but I don't think it deals with labor mobility at all. And that's another area of unfinished work that we really need to look at because uh, we, we, we are still stuck in a couple decades old classification of how people get visas and how they move back and forth across the border. Uh, and we need to update it. I don't think this deal does that. Yeah, what we've heard from the U, uh, from the reading of the Mexican uh, text and, and media is that the TN visa situation stays status quo, but there's no upgrading in new professions and, and new uh, recognition of, of higher skilled labor. Okay. Uh, Jackie Powers asks something that I think a lot of uh, dairy farmers and, and others are wondering on the concessions. Any dollar value on the cost to, to dairy farmers uh, out of this? Anything that can quantify it above and beyond, you know, X percentage of the market allotted? Uh, great question. I'm going to pass on That's that. Maybe Scotty wants to take, uh, take that. But let's keep in mind the potential benefits for consumers and also that eventually, slowly, slowly, Canada's dairy market is becoming more competitive for new entrants to the market, new products, and ultimately that's a good thing. Uh, Scotty, how is the, I mean, the dairy was such a huge part of the rhetoric in the entire lead up t until today. How is it being perceived there or, or is this uh, as much a win for the president as, as he uh, indicated it was during his press conference today? Well, the president does use uh, a little bit of hyperbole from time to time, as we know. Uh, you know, is this a great deal or the greatest deal of all time, right? That Those are your choices. Um, in terms of dairy, he was pretty fixated on this Class 7 ultra-filtered milk powder issue, mm -hmm. which is a real issue. And uh, the United States basically got what it wanted on that. Now, what the United States did not get is a complete dismantling of supply management. Uh, so Canada, Canada was able to preserve uh, a lot of what it needed to preserve for its own purposes in, in dairy uh, and in agriculture, and the U.S. made a little bit of progress. So I think in this one, uh, both sides get to claim victory. It didn't really seem like the U.S., though, had been asking for a full dismantling of supply management. I, I never heard that at any point. And when we looked at the levels of market access that have been offered, uh, there was a certain level in the Canada-EU agreement, something north of 3%, and then something more was offered in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and this is still under 5%. So it's been an incremental increase in market access, really very manageable. It should be very manageable for Canadian dairy. Okay, we're going to see because I'm sure there'll be some qu more questions on that. We're going to pause our conversation and say goodbye to those of you watching on CBC News Network. Carol McNeil will have a lot more reaction to this trade deal coming up. But we are continuing our conversation, taking your questions online. So please submit them on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. We'll be back with you in just a few seconds there. Have a great night.
And we are back with Mary Scott Greenwood and Laura Dawson. I'm Vashi Capellos, and this is the Extended Power in Politics Online. I'll take another question. Uh, let's start, uh, Scotty, with Valerie Kathleen on Facebook. Can you talk about the intellectual data provision? Uh, sure. Believe it or not, I'm happy to talk about Great. that. Uh, you, you know, there are the, the part of the modernization of this agreement is how do you deal with what's known as follow-on biologics. Biologics are um, the new kind of medicine that's based on human biology, not just chemistry. And so how do you deal with um, the data protection, the intellectual property uh, for the people that create these life-saving measures? And what, what the industry, the innovative industry wanted was 10 years of protection. Actually, they wanted 12 years, mm -hmm. um, but they're getting 10 years of protection. That's a few more years uh, than an old existing agreement. So that is a win for innovators in Canada and the United States. And um, it's something that will be controversial and will certainly be debated, uh, you know, on both sides of the border. But it's uh, if you want to have if you want to have life saving measures, you've got to be able to create an environment where where innovators come up with new products. So that's this is what that's about. And it's uh, it's 10 years, I think, in, in the yeah, in the new agreement. And that's what Mexico agreed to. And and it's a little less than the U.S. wanted, but uh, from our perspective, it's a step in the right direction. Yeah, and it's important to remember, this is an, a particular class of drugs. These are gene therapies. They're extraordinarily... Aren't they kind of the wave of the future, they though? They are. It's what everybody wants if they get sick, but they're extraordinarily difficult to develop. They're not the usual, what we call small molecule drugs. They are um, the stuff that, you know, it takes billions of dollars to develop. It's so much more expensive and difficult to develop these kinds of drugs that the innovators want this extra level of protection. But at the same time, it's still a small segment of the market, it is probably not going to result in higher drug prices. Well, that's the concern I want to board. ask you about because there are, you know, there are people saying that this will mean generics, you know, the, the generics don't have the access to that technology, you know, that that knowledge base and therefore we'll pay more for drugs. Yeah, and what it actually means is 10 years of data protection. What does that mean? It means that the innovator who has done all the clinical trials and all of the testing does not have to release his results to the generic industry for 10 years. So, you know, that seems pretty reasonable. If you put all that investment in, you should have the benefit of, um, you know, profiting from your from your investment or we wouldn't have this kind of innovation. Okay, Laura, I'll follow up uh, Maralina, and I apologize if I'm pronouncing this incorrectly, Repo on Facebook asks, is it true that the energy proportionality is 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 no longer in NAFTA? And this is something that the Minister Freeland brought up. That's a great question. I am pretty sure that Marilena is right. Um, it seems to be gone. Those of uh, you who are, are historians of the NAFTA and you in the Canada-U.S. Free Trade Agreement remember that there was a portion, proportional access clause on water and and energy uh, in the uh, in the original agreements that if Canada ever shut off its taps uh, to the U.S., that it would have to proportionately reduce its own its own uh, own uses as well it's I have been reliably informed it's gone 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 on both water and on on energy and in fact there's a, a an additional statement on water that says we are not in the business of trading water and this is this agreement is not intended to cover bulk water exports. okay Alan Musgrave on Facebook Scotty asks Will the increase in the, this is a question about the tech, technical aspects of de minimis, but I'll also get you to weigh in on it more more um, broadly. Will the increase in the de minimis threshold apply to only online sales or all sales, including cross border shopping? Great question. So it's online sales, and uh, it it's not clear how the tax part of that provision goes. I think there's some more work to be done there. I know uh, that there are a number of everybody on this one is kind of mad. There, no, nobody is really happy uh, or completely happy, I should say, with the outcome. Although it's a, it's a step in the right direction to raise the threshold, um, but it's for online shopping. If you travel across the border, uh, your your de minimis level, you can buy $200 a day worth of goods uh, before you get charged uh, tariffs. Uh, when you shop online now, it's uh, it's 150, I think, for the new new agreement. So this is just online. Okay. And uh, Todd Calicott on YouTube asks: All feelings aside, for Trudeau and the Trade Minister, was this a good deal? Hmm. Laura, I'll throw that one at you first. Yeah, it was. It was the best available deal under the circumstances. I think you know the Canadian negotiators were sitting there with that old clash song: "Should I stay or should I go now?" <laughs> and I think they held on as long as they could, got enough technical elements of the deal done, got down to tr making real trade-offs and real concessions. And you know, the old negotiators say the best deal is where everybody walks away feeling a little bit slighted. <laughs> Scotty, what do you think? And, and I wonder, we've, we had this discussion among a number of our panels tonight, but how much the context, and I mean, I mean context always matters, but the, the, the sort of worst case scenario, the motherload as we were being threatened with last week, impacted the 
end evaluation of who walked away a winner and a loser. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm really, I, I mean, I don't doubt that the president of the United States would, would pull a crazy Ivan and would do something that's, that's, that's not in his own interest economically just to, tr to try to win a fight. That's, that's not beyond President Trump. But what, what I think is really commendable uh, is that it, at the end of the day, the Trudeau government didn't take the bait, right? Because um, the president was using really, and my, meanwhile, also neither did the Mexicans when, when, when there was all of this harsh incendiary rhetoric being used about Mexico and then it was being used about Canada. And you could have sort of said, look, we're not going to cave to the bully. That's not what this is about. And you could have just decided to have a fight with the president and not save the economy. But instead, Canada kept cool. Mexico did, too, and said, you know, we're just going to get a better deal. And I was surprised by how much Canada got. I don't know about Laura, but I was surprised that Canada was able to hang on to Chapter 19, the dispute resolution uh, mechanism. I thought for sure that would be something that Lighthizer would flip the table over. And Canada actually won the day on that one. So, um, I, you know, I'm really happy and surprised in Canada and Mexico kept cool in the face of a really challenging and kind of uh, all over the place uh, partner in the United States. Yeah, I think Chapter 19 was the biggest surprise to me too. I was pretty sure Canada was going to have to walk that back, come up with a less satisfactory mechanism. And the fact that they got Chapter 19, got status quo on most of the other contentious issues, that's a win. Yeah, we're getting a lot of questions on all platforms about hormones in in U.S. dairy, and uh, can either of you guys address whether regulate uh, if there will be any change in regulations or how that might impact. I mean, a lot of people who are concerned that the labeling is different and that kind of thing. Well, now, now we're getting into the stump the band question, and this is why I'm <laughs> glad that somebody really smart like Laura Dawson is on this panel, because the only thing I know about hormone and dairies is, is what I know from my good friends at Ben and & Jerry's, and they use no growth hormones in their ice cream. But honestly, I don't know what's uh, in this deal, and I'm hoping Laura can help me out. Um, I, I don't think it's what's in the deal that's necessarily important because we already have a very strong regime with the United States and what they call sanitary and phytosanitary measures that has to do with, with labeling, that has to do with um, what is permissible on either side of the border. It is still, whether it is hormones or additives or pornography, it is still um, not permissible to import something that is illegal in your own territory. Now, I know Canada and the U.S. have been working together for years on um, uh, alignment and recognition on their dairy regime. So there'll be nothing in this agreement on dairy or anything else that says, Canada, you must buy something that is prohibited currently in your regime. Um, Scotty Japlica Talek on Facebook asks, is this a lesson for Canada in that we should start trading with other countries so that not all of our exports go to the U.S.? Uh, well, that's, that's a decision for Canada to make, although Laura rightly pointed out earlier that uh, the United States is the easiest, biggest market. So um, I think trade diversification is a great idea. The fact is that you live next to a relatively well-to-do uh, country that wants to consume everything you can possibly make or grow, and that's a benefit. So I think the, the better uh, way to look at this is let's have some rules of the road. Let's have a, let's have a fair, agreed-upon way to uh, fight it out when we need to fight it out, but let's have a path forward. The, the other thing I would just say is, um, it sounds a little bit trite, but I think Canada, the United States, and Mexico, our North American neighborhood is better together. I would much rather have all of us kind of arm in arm dealing with the many challenges that we face as a neighborhood versus the rest of the world than trying to look back and forth to each other. But I mean, I understand the instinct and I understand the desire to not be so reliant on the United States because every once in a while we elect, you know, a set of leaders that makes it really hard to do business with us. I get it. Laura, can I ask you about actually a part of the deal that has to do with this, and that's China. Uh -huh. And and what was agree can you can you sort of explain this? Is there is it significant? It sounds significant on the face of it for me, but I'm not the expert on what we agreed to as far as the potential for an FTA with China and the kind of notice that we have to give the U.S. Yeah, uh, we're all going to have to look at that much more carefully because on the face of it, it looks like hey, if you're planning on doing a deal with a non-market economy mm -hmm. or you know economy that we uh, that we object to, um, that we can talk about suspending your benefits uh, under this agreement. So that has the potential to be very serious. At Is that new? Like, have you seen that in other agreements? No. No, that's kind of innovative. Um, at the same time, the practicality of it is Canada's been uh, dancing around a deal with China for the last four or five years and has just found that in terms of market size and negotiating capacity, it just has been a non-starter. Uh, in my opinion, if Canada is going to do any kind of a deal with China, it's got to be in tandem with the United States and in tandem with the North America partners because only then do you get the kind of market power you need. So Canada doing an end run around the U.S. on China doesn't make sense anyway. I think this is the 
the commitment that they could make without any real danger of actual, you know, punitive. Is response. there any way, though, given uh, Scotty, and I'll end on this, the the rhetoric from the president towards China, and and just actually what we've heard at today's press conference, the last one he gave last week, um, that that there, I mean, that that Canada would ever be on the exact same page when it comes to free trade with China? That Canada would be on the same as page the US. as the U.S.? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's conceivable that Canada and the United States could be on the same uh, could be on the same page. China has a lot of practices uh, that we here uh, in the West really object to. Um, so I, I think it's conceivable that Canada and the United States could be on the on the same page. I really wish that the U.S. were part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership because, after all, that would have been a really good, effective block and a counterweight to uh, to China, which, as Laura quite rightly says, is really needed. So um, so we'll see how it plays out. China China is a whole different. Uh, kettle of fish, as they say, and and we are going to have to work together on all kinds of issues. We, Canada, the United States, in issues like cybersecurity and other kinds of security. Uh, so, so I think we we ultimately will get to be on the same page if we're not today. Okay, that wraps up our extended social media edition of Power and Politics. Thank you for all your smart questions on the new trade deal, and thank you especially to Mary Scott Greenwood and Laura Dawson, Dawson for helping us understand. The deal. I'm Vashi Capellas. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Vashi. Thanks, Thanks Laura. guys. Thanks, Scotty. Bye. Bye. Appreciate it. Okay.